be embarrassed if everyone in your workplace looks like you. Men, women, and those who identify as neither and both. The more love you give, the more love you have. Be embarrassed. Ask him, what bad thing did you do to her? Do you all pledge with me? Are Portman's arguments reliable? What does she leave out? And which rhetorical shortcuts does she take? What does this mean for the reliability of so many celebrity speeches that are designed to persuade people about equality, inclusion and representation? Portman's speech is called a step-by-step -step guide to toppling the patriarchy. Step-by-step -step suggests a detailed plan based on solid argumentation, but is that what we get? Before analyzing the new material, here are some highlights from my previous video. Let's stop saying that women are choosing to drop out of the workforce because of their families. That's wrong. It's wrong. And yet, she was able to mention two almost exclusively female professions. Today, almost all gynecologists are women. Well, what about the hair and makeup and wardrobe departments? They're like entirely female. Not bad when you're oppressed by the patriarchy. Celebrities like Portman keep moving the goalpost in order to stay relevant. Now it's no longer enough to work, it's no longer enough to have equal opportunities. It's not even enough to rule certain jobs. No, there must be equality of outcome, at least in industries with money and status. This video analyzes the reliability of the reasons Portman gives for the lack of representation, which is actually the difference between men and women in terms of interests and priorities. And that's the elephant in the room, because people like Portman, who believe in so-called genderless and gender-inclusive approaches, can't admit to gender differences. We're about to see the part of the speech where things get extra juicy, as they say, so hang on. Before we begin, I have to point out a discrepancy right from the beginning. The word gender inclusive acknowledges gender, the word genderless does not. So how Portman's approach can be both tells us everything about the inconsistency of the worldview we're about to see on full display. It's not supposed to make sense because it's not about truth. The reason women in nearly every industry are not represented in powerful positions is because women are being discriminated against or retaliated against for hiring and for promotion. When they do get the jobs, they are being often being harassed and they are being paid less than their male counterparts, all of which coerce self-preserving women into finding safer options for themselves and different ways to feel valued. Portman has a bachelor's degree from Howard. But the way she argues isn't even middle school level because she literally doesn't make arguments. Listing a bunch of claims isn't argumentation. Claims need grounds and definitely in Portman's case, considering the big generalizations she makes, backing in order to be considered argumentation. In nearly every industry... Nearly is a hedge that she uses as a rhetorical shortcut so that she doesn't have to account for every industry. She does the same with the adverb often. They are being often being harassed. A great way to evade the responsibility she has for proving this, and proving it in large and unequivocal numbers at that. Discriminating has become a popular word to try and shut down debate. It means to make an unjust or prejudicial distinction in the treatment of different categories of people, especially on the grounds of ethnicity and gender. So it's quite rich to hear that word from Portman when her speech is a long line of prejudices and categorizations. Same as Portman's colleague, Captain Marvel. USC Annenberg's inclusive initiative released findings that 67% of the top critics reviewing the 100 highest grossing movies were white males. Am I saying that I hate white dudes? No, I'm not. Other people besides white dudes like Star Wars and would love the opportunity to do a set visit. I do not need a 40-year-old white dude to tell me what didn't work for him about A Wrinkle in Time. <sighs> it's ironic to hear the word inclusive mixed in with literally discriminating statements. USC Annenberg's inclusive initiative. Thus, all in all, it sounds more like projection when Portman says the word discriminated, followed by another baseless claim or retaliated against Portman's monopolizing terms before the opposing side has a chance to use the same terms against her and her allies. Constitutive rhetoric is about constituting an audience, speaking as if this audience has been in existence for a long time, when the truth is that the speaker creates the audience via the speech. It's all about getting the audience riled up to get them to do something. 
Speakers play on the audience's indignation. We've already heard the word discriminating. But there's also this one. Coerce. And this phrase. And different ways to feel valued. What these words and phrases all have in common is that they appeal to emotion, anger, indignation and feeling hurt. She also repeats the word safe quite a few times in the following. A word with positive connotations that appeals to a feeling that all people like. She mentions getting paid less in passing, ignoring the complexity of this area of discussion. She doesn't even take a moment to consider how individual negotiations with employers and amount of work hours affect payment for women and for men. This kind of covert argumentation where she doesn't define her presuppositions is as evasive as it gets. But the best is yet to come. Next, notice the repetition of the words discriminating and often. Many women are further oppressed by intersections with other marginalized identities, whether by sexual orientation, race, age, class, religion, physical ability, and are subject to multiple avenues of discrimination and harassment at work at once. And then if they try and report it, there's often a second harassment and their reputations are smeared, their future hiring is jeopardized, and they are further harassed. So. One could think that this passage is a gender-inclusive storyline from one of Portman's updated fairy tales, because her imagination here is quite vivid, but unfortunately for Portman, it's also intentionally oversimplifying and thus deceptive. Oppressed, oppressed marginalized. marginalized Portman knows which popularized words to use in order to play on the audience's emotions and keep feeding the profitable victim narrative. The irony is quite hilarious. She's standing on one of the world's largest podiums and talks about oppression and marginalization while judging male oppressors, knowing that if anyone dared go against her narrative, they'd be booed out of the room and their careers would be in jeopardy to say the least. That goes to show who's really marginalized and just as important, who isn't marginalized. But again, for Portman, it's about monopolizing the right terms. So, by the sound of it, she can't wait to get to the next part. I wonder why. Could it be because she knows that she hasn't given any grounds and that everything up until now has been the world's longest pathos appeal? No, that can't be. And most certainly, all of this isn't about advertising for her movement. They need to be able to do their work in a safe, equitable and dignified environment. In its first year, our Time's Up Legal Defense Fund has served more than 3,500 people, from workers at McDonald's, to prison guards, to military personnel, to women in our own industry, who have faced gender-based harassment, discrimination, coercion. The way Portman's disregarded definitions and proof isn't exactly the best incentive to trust her movement's definitions of all the cases she mentions. Equitable and dignified environment. Equitable means fair and impartial, unbiased. First of all, has Portman herself been impartial? No, she's been anything but, and equality of outcome is anything but impartial. Secondly, she keeps using terms that allow her and her movement to keep moving the goalpost. Now, equitable means leadership positions, but not only that, it's also about topping the list. Why do women graduate 50-50 from all business schools and yet make up only 10.6% of the Fortune 500 boards and 4.8% of Fortune 500 CEOs? Thus, they'll keep moving the goalpost in order to finance the movement and finance powerful events like this, because there is no end goal. At Time's Up, we want all people, men, women, and those who identify as neither and both, to lead the charge to make hiring more fair, make wages more equitable, and make the workplace environment safe and dignified for all. The amount of repetitions and lack of specificity are off the charts. This is another round of the same unsubstantiated terms. Safe, equitable, and dignified environment. Safe and dignified for all. For example, what does she mean by safe? One of the words she repeats to make people feel good. What constitutes safety in a postmodern and post-logic world? So essentially the employee will reach out and say, hey, this is my preferred pronoun. This is how I would like to be addressed, whether it's he, she, they, them, their, mm -hmm. whatever they would like to use. We want to make sure we honor that request and make them feel comfortable in the workplace. Aside from obvious illegal practices, how Portman and like-minded people define words like safe and equitable is very different from how many other people would define them. Portman's solution, she doesn't define the words at all, which indicates that her word choice is deliberately vague. And those who identify as neither and both. Aside from the obvious absence of logic, the more relevant observation here is, how would she define a man or woman without discriminating people in the crowd? 
It'd be quite revealing to see her dodge that question. We now have Time's Up chapters in tech, in finance, in advertising, in journalism, in medicine, and we have sister organizations among restaurant workers, domestic workers, and farm workers who organize far before we did. We are thousands of women across multiple industries internationally joining together to make the same demands of the world. And this opportunistic movement founded in the wake of the Me Too campaign has also since dissipated to Portman's dismay. But anything to make the collective we sound greater than it turned out to be, I guess. The humble collective we, I should add. Domestic workers and farm workers who organized far before we did. Next, it's time for the third ideological effect, getting people to do something. Which is what all of the emotional appeals have built up to. So what can you do? First, money. You can give or you can raise money for the Legal Defense Fund. Money. Portman has an estimated net worth of $125 million. So the reason why she laughs is either because she's embarrassed to say what she really wants from people, or because she knows she has to act embarrassed. No matter how much she laughs though, she's still asking for people's money. We have created the People's Fund of Maui. So if you send a donation... The number one need is money. Is money. What do I do? What do I do? This is what you do. <laughs> Second, gather. Meet with other women and see what changes you want to make. Through Time's Up or On Your Own, gathering has been the central principle of what we do and has created every action we have taken. If gathering has been the central principle of what they do and has created every action they've taken, it's interesting that money was the first thing on her mind. First, money. You'd think that money from donors and sponsors has indeed created every action. Also, telling women to gather is as vague as everything else in this speech, but the crucial thing for Portman and like-minded people is to get people to view themselves as group members rather than as individuals. And if you happen to share the same innate characteristics, of course you must gather, right? And see what changes you want to make. And if the changes a person wants to make go against the group's wishes, then what? So much for individuality. To Portman and like-minded people, it's all about outer characteristics, about community with other people because of the innate characteristics people happen to share. Third, listen, if any group you're in has people who only look like you, change that group. It's an awakening experience to hear from women who have different experiences of marginalization. I had a dream that she was finally going to say that people in the audience should talk to people outside their bubble, but it turns out her statements were about emphasizing a restraint, that the different experiences have to be about marginalization. It can't be people who are happy with their job and life. It's about protecting the victim narrative at all costs, and the best way to do that is to make as many people as possible feel marginalized. Be embarrassed if everyone in your workplace looks like you. Pay attention to physical ability, age, race, orientation, gender identity, and make sure you've got all kinds of experiences represented. Irony doesn't get any better than this. She's regurgitating the only narrative that's officially allowed in Hollywood, talking about surrounding yourself with different kinds of people, to a crowd of people who all believe the same, or have financial and career advancing incentives to believe the same. So could Portman be projecting when she says, Be embarrassed. There's nothing like shaming to expose that the speaker doesn't care about arguments, definitions, or truth, but only in controlling the agenda. Portman's rhetoric is literally surface level because she encourages people to look at people's surface, so to speak, their orientation and gender. Not a word about talent or personality. This is the end result of categorizing people according to their outer characteristics, how they look and what they were born as, not their inner characteristics. That's equality of outcome, which isn't about equality at all. And heard you speaking about a cabinet that was equal men and women. Today it is gender balance, 17 women, 17 men. It was clearly intentional. Um, you've introduced a bill. C25 to increase female representation on boards, to essentially sort of shame corporations into doing it. You nod. Th that's exactly it. it. Gossip well. Stop the rhetoric that a woman is crazy or difficult. If a man says to you that a woman is crazy or difficult, ask him, what bad thing did you do to her? Howard-level argumentation, I must say. 
And judging from the applause, it totally sounds like Portman's taken her own advice and surrounded herself with different types of people. Here, it's relevant to note how Portman's surface-level thinking affects her discernment. All she sees is gender, even though she still hasn't defined gender. While it might be rare that a person is crazy, it's not rare that a person is difficult, irrespective of gender. However, this is Portman's get-out-of-jail-free card, a way to avoid accountability for what she and like-minded people say and do. If you label them in a negative way, you've done something wrong. Like I said, Howard level stuff that tells us quite a few things about Portman's personality. Judging from her passion here, it sounds like it's something she gets a lot. I wouldn't have any idea why though, I mean everything she said has been so nuanced and inclusive, not to mention balanced. I was like, baby, Kavanaugh, Kavanaugh, I don't sleep. Stop the rhetoric that a woman is crazy or difficult. That's a code. That's a code word. He is trying to discredit her reputation. Of course, that's always the case. And as we all know, it's only men who can discredit someone's reputation. I mean, it's not like other demographics are capable of trying to discredit someone's reputation. He has the window down, he's smoking, and at some point he starts howling. He's howling like like an animal. I was able to turn the things that I've lived through, my pain, my life experiences, into work, into action, into providing a voice for other people. Also, could Portman have said this in a more calculating fashion? He is trying to discredit her reputation. Reputation. It's so calculating that it ends up being condescending, and it's not even good acting. Don't shy away from consequences for those who abuse their power. Those who abuse power are not going to have a change of behavior out of the goodness of their hearts. They are motivated by self-interest and they will only change their behavior if they have to worry they will lose what they care about. And what about Portman herself? She's in a position of power, which is kind of strange considering the patriarchal structures she's trying to topple. And she's given a speech with nothing but appeals to people's emotion, anger, indignation and pity. What's her self-interest in that? So when she's talking about being motivated by self-interest, she's talking about herself, especially considering the opportunistic origin of this movement. Shouldn't she be challenged in that as well? What will she do to change her behavior? Oh wait, I already know the answer to that one. Ask him, what bad thing did you do to her? We've definitely seen and heard the goodness of Portman's heart. Out of the goodness of their hearts. That our family of animals, mammals, is named after us, women. Many men are behaving like we live in a zero-sum game. That if women get the respect, access, and value they deserve, that men will lose theirs. But we know the message of the mammaries. The more milk you give, the more milk you make. Yes, I don't know why men wouldn't feel included in Portman's rhetoric, which isn't deliberately divisive at all. All I know is that it's men's fault somehow. What bad thing did you do to her? The more milk you make. At the respect, access, and value they deserve. First of all, what Portman's doing here is that she monopolizes positive terms, when the fact is that she loads these terms with a different meaning. Because what she's hinting at is equality of outcome, that you deserve things based on how you look. Secondly, no matter who you are, you earn respect and access because of your talent and personality, not because you identify as a member of group such and such. This is as superficial as it gets. The more love you give, the more love you have. Are we talking about Portman's brand of love? Because I'm quite sure there are lots of people who wouldn't want to be on the receiving end of that. If this is Portman talking about love, what does it look like when she's not talking about love? I like the singing though, very unexpected. The more love you give, you give, you give, and next, the ideology of equality of outcome is on full display. Equality in name only, of course. If every powerful woman in this room pledges to hire three women in jobs this year that women don't usually get, 
Directors, cinematographers, VFX supervisors, composers, stunt coordinators, board members. I mean, like, all the jobs are jobs that women don't usually get. <laughs> Just pick three jobs that you get to choose and light a woman's torch. Once again, I can't understand if anyone feels excluded by this rhetoric. Portman truly seems to want what's best for all groups in society. I'm just wondering, at whose expense should these people be hired? Which group shouldn't be hired, in order for another group to be hired? Thus, Portman's the embodiment of what she supposedly advocates against, that if one group gets what they deserve, the other group won't, because she's literally marginalizing one group in order to favor another. So it makes sense why she's monopolized the term marginalized, so that it can't be used against her. The way she constantly plays on women's indignation is more than calculating. That women don't usually get. That women don't usually get. Don't get, she says, implying that there are unfair things going on, and not that men and women have different interests, and thus choose different jobs. Anything to avoid talking about each individual's own free will. People must view themselves as group members, so rather than free will, people must think in terms of group will. However, when it's the right kind of equality, there's no problem. Today, almost all gynecologists are women. Well, what about the hair and makeup and wardrobe departments? They're, like, entirely female. That's also called hypocrisy, by the way. That light will multiply and the heat will intensify for all of us. You all pledge with me. Yeah! Love you. Pledges. Yes, because that's how life works. The ending is as mature as everything that preceded it. So in that sense, it's very appropriate. Thanks for tuning in.